Hi everyone, so today I will be reviewing to a non-fiction science book called The Future of Humanity by Michio Kaku. So as you might know, Michio Kaku is an American physicist, futurist, and communicator of science. And I would say in this book that he was able to showcase all of his title as a physicist, futurist, and science communicator. So the book mainly talks about as humans transitions between living here on Earth to alternative places like like the moon or planet Mars. Michio Kaku also talks about the technology that will make it possible to do a safer and more efficient way to space travel. Before I get started on actually reviewing the book itself, I would like to note that this video will contain some ideas regarding the book. So if you want to find out the idea by yourself, feel free to leave this video. But if you're okay with that, Let's just get started. So the book has a really strong opening. Um, Michio Kaku was able to weave between science fiction and also real science regarding space exploration. So the first few chapters in the author provides a really concise information concerning how space travel is being funded, how firstly it was government funded and then the Valentine massacre happened and then how it's being revived again by private companies such as SpaceX and Blue Origin. There is certainly that kind of whimsical feeling about the theories in this book but in no way or form that it is too much, at least in my opinion. That happens because this book is very well written. So the author starts his argument by providing the historical context about space exploration and then the current technologies surrounding it. And then he would start about his theory about the future of uh, space exploration. That form structure really forms a neat argument and easy to follow to the readers, especially those of you who's not the most familiar when it comes to physics or just natural science in general. I do have a little bit critic for the beginning portion of the book. I wish that the author would provide more regarding the state of the Earth, its current state, and also the future of Earth, how it might be depleted. So it will provide a stronger argument why we should seek for alternative places to live as opposed to Earth. Enough for a little bit of criticism. Another positive point in my opinion opinion, especially for someone who didn't really go up with learning that much about natural science. I think this book is highly entertaining and accessible. So Michio Kaku really able to weave into pop cultures, like sciences he mentions about like Tony Stark's Iron Man suit and he also, I think he mentions Star Trek if I'm not mistaken. So it is a very entertaining and engaging to read. I feel like I'm not really reading a book, I'm listening to a really fun lecture by a professor who's very passionate about their job who didn't lose their inner child. Okay, so I would just like to discuss a little bit about the content of the book. So the part one of this book mainly talks about how to colonize Mars and the moon. And there's also his theory on how to establish base on the moon and also terraform Mars. The author starts by explaining of findings in the 1990s in which scientists discover a presence of a large quantity of ice in the southern hemisphere of the moon that is a perpetual darkness that is below freezing. So the origin of the ice is probably a cometary impact in the early history of the early solar system. Comets are mainly made by ice dust and rock. So any comet that strikes the moon in this shadow area might leave a deposit of water and ice. Then water in turn can be made of oxygen and hydrogen. So a group of Silicon Valley's RD tried to basically create a company to begin the process of mining the ice from the moon. But it also raises a tricky question which is, is it legal? to mine the moon. As a law student, I would say that I'm really happy that the book is also showing that political side of moon mining, of like space utilization, exploration. So basically in 1976, the Outer Space Treaty banned the ownership of celestial bodies in which 
moon will be included as well as the whole body. However, the treaty doesn't really say much regarding the private ownership of the land or the usage of the moon for commercial activities because, you know, when, it, when the treaty was being made, uh, the drafters, they didn't really think that it would be possible for uh, private companies or for individual to actually reach the moon. So the book also explores that there's technical and political stuff that needs to be taken care of such as this legality for example in order to actually create a moon base and then after that of course the author started to explain the strategy to not just survive but also thrive in the moon like how astronauts will need to have their food carried from earth and that would absolutely be really expensive so basically it's very important that the moon base will be self-sufficient that will be able to create its own oxygen and also food really like how the author provides a certain challenge in the moon like the high level of radiation that could cause cancer and how it could be mitigated by for example building an underground base with lava tube on the moon and i also really like how the author didn't just focused on how to survive there but also how to thrive there he also thinks about the possible recreation that people could go to when they leave uh, on the moon so for example by just taking advantage of the moon itself like hiking and also riding dune puggies and he didn't just exclusively brought this mindset in colonizing the moon but also colonizing the mars of course when people try to colonize the mars it's not just how to survive but also how people will be able to thrive the theory that i quite like is how the two giant polar ice cap from mars could be turned into an attraction for the people there so one of the giant ice cap will stay the same throughout the year as it is made by frozen water but the other one would look different throughout the year as it made of dry ice and carbon dioxide so it will expand or contract so that's just basically the main discussion regarding the first part of the book the second part also provides other alternative for human settlement like for example living on europa or titan and i do think that as someone who is not from natural science it is really informative so even though it existed in the realm of gas giant liquid water can be found on europa because it is basically covered by a thick layer of ice and titan saturn moon also has a complex network of ponds, lakes, ice sheet, and landmass. I also really like how even from alternative, there's another alternative. For example, like living in stars and exoplanets. And of course, that explanation is not left out from its respective pros and cons. And I would say that the most informative point about this book is that pros and cons points. And of course, how to to mitigate each cons through using science and technology and i found the most interesting description about planets that has like four solar systems or planets that are made out from diamond so it really is appropriate to the tone in his book which is that science fiction could be turned into reality and of course when talking about a future i don't think it will be completed without talking about artificial intelligence so regarding the ai the writer basically argues that the framework of building an ai is to replace us to do the job that are dangerous dull and dirty it's not saying ai should just totally replace us those are the kind of frameworks that ai should replace instead he also talks about how ai might be able to evolve way more advanced than humans and how it will basically be humans demise i do think that kind of discussion is very important when it comes to talking about the ai so really like how the author is not completely biased 
nor against AI. He provides a very thorough lens when talking about such complex topic. So reading his argument from this book really feels like reading a white paper. I feel like I'm a government and I could just determine my own instead of this is what I think and this is how you should also think. So he's just basically provides us with any other alternatives, a lot of alternatives and you could you could always choose like in no way or form that I'm trying to force you to think this way or anything like that. Okay, so the possible cons of the book is probably going to be the middle section. Maybe it's just because, again, I didn't really grew up with natural science. I stopped during middle school when it comes to studying natural science. So the middle part when he talks about spaceship, I was a little lost. It could get uh, very, very theoretical, even though I could see that the author is still trying to make his point as accessible as possible. But I just, I, I really need to push myself around it, around reading it. It could get Bit, bit tedious for me personally but after that part passed it's actually really interesting again for me because he also talks about other even other alternatives like how in the future we could be the beings that are immortal both uh, biologically and digitally so i do think that this point is certainly much more accessible the point regarding digital immortality and the ethical standpoint of it and also transhumanism and basically to enhance ourselves, our ability by using technologies kind of like iron man actually and in this part he also like gives a warning to us like hey maybe you don't have like that too much ego as well uh, don't believe that we could actually defeat aliens as if like the aliens and this is this is also the one of the best part i think for the book is also his humor we shouldn't be arrogant to the point that thinking that we will able to defeat aliens by injecting a virus to their computer as if they're using microsoft as a computer so that is really engaging and fun to read because the author talks a lot about the alternatives of leaving earth there's still other places that we might be able to set but I couldn't help but also to think that what if it's just the end of everything? What if it's the end of the universe? And this alternatives is just basically, well, we don't have alternatives anymore because it's the end of everything. It's the end of all the alternatives as well. I'm very happy that the author also think through this point. He also provides point where physics might be able to help humans when the universe is at its demise. So I would totally recommend this book if you are a layman. Granted, uh, there's that middle portion. Maybe, maybe it's just me. I'm not very familiar, especially when it comes to machines and to physics theory. And the middle section could get a little too theoretical. So in uni, I had a space law course and I haven't read this book. Uh, at that point and I was really disappointed at myself because I had this book on my TBR for the longest of time. I had this book already on my shelf during that space law course. That's basically an illustration that even if you are not a physicist, you're not someone from the natural science department, this book is still really really relevant. Reading this book, I feel like I'm entering a time machine in which it brings me to the past and then it also provides me with the current state of space exploration as well as the hypotheticals, the future theories regarding it. So overall, I would give this book a 4 out of 5 stars. Kudos uh, for Michio Kaku to make physics accessible, especially for me. But it does provide a comprehensive narrative concerning space exploration, the alternatives, and also its auxiliary concepts. So let's today's review of The Future of Humanity by Michio Kaku. I hope that this review will help you in determining if this book is worth your time. Kindly let me know in the comment section below if you are planning to read this book or if you had read this book. Please share your thought. Before I sign off, I would like to thank everyone who made it to the end. Thank you guys so much for watching and may your tea will always be warm for reading.